just want to get some coffee or something. Can I get a cup of coffee? Black? Can't you see we talking? White? Even little kids in Mexico drink <laughs> coffee. Well, I'm not a little kid in Mexico, okay? <laughs> Damn fine cup of coffee. You want a cup of coffee? No coffee. Coffee drinker, huh? Maybe we can grab some coffee. Coffee, 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 coffee. Decaf, is it? Viennese cinnamon. Viennese cinnamon. Here I am drinking my coffee like a little kid in Mexico. Mm. It's so delicious. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. Um, today is UFO Wednesday, which means uh, the show is co host by my friend Don Ecker. All Hi, right. Don Ecker. Yeah. Hey, Don. Peace. And, a show, of course, is managed. Uh, the chat is managed by Martina Costa Santana, hey, who hey. is from all right. All right. Venezuela, Ohio. Because Ohio, just like Mexico, is a shithole. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> and today's guest is John Brandenburg, PhD and an actual rocket scientist. I'm not going to tell you that it requires a rocket scientist to do this show, but we got one. That's right. <laughs> and we are here to uh, talk to John Brandenburg about stuff. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and stuff John Brandenburg, happens of course, on Mars, apparently, as well as Earth. Exactly. But you know what? Who gives a shit about Martians? Does Mars still need women? As funny as that sounded, you, sir, are a racist. Thank you, Keith. Um, <laughs> Keith John? can't be here. Does, does Mars still need women? Yes. Oh my yes, God! Yes, it does needs mm. men too. <laughs> hey, before we begin, got a I man was, up to go to Mars. Oh yes, before we begin, uh, we need to thank our chat, who is here. I want to thank Dragon Ruse, you son of a bitch. He snuck in last night, dude, and po made the first post. That sneaky bastard. Uh, Real Way Nation is technically the first post of the morning, but Dragon Ruse wins. Uh, I want to welcome both of them. I want to welcome Anima Confusa, the love of my life. Uh, let's see. Scott Lewis, whom I live with, and his boss, man. He's boss, damn it. He is boss. And uh, and he says, good morning to everybody. Sean Estep is here. Good morning, man. I hope you're going to enjoy the show. Uh, Dragon Roos showed up again. Coffee, coffee, coffee. That's right. Coffee, 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 coffee. Um, Let's see who else. Darius Munchausen is here with his super sticker, and I'm sure it's a coffee yep. uh, mug. Yep, I know, I know, I know Darius. Darius Munchausen is, of course, the safest Munchausen for children. Uh, Penny is here. Good morning, Penny. Penny is Dork Knight's mom, uh, who is a regular on our show. And uh, let's see who else is here. Who else showed up? Is that it? That's it. I got them all. I nailed it. Oh, no. Colonizer oh. Jeebus is here. Jeebus is the Jeebus previously known as Monkey Jeebus. It is now Colonizer Jeebus. He is uh, one of our good audience members and uh, one of the most beautiful Japanese men I've ever met. What? Is he's he gorgeous. Not, he's not Indian? No. Oh. oh, you thought he would be Indian like this? Oh, thank you. Come again. No, he is not. Oh, shit. I got to do it again. Here we go. As funny as that sounded, you, sir, are a racist. Thank you, Keith. I like knowing that. <laughs> but um, this is going to be a fun show, and I'm excited about this, John, because I've known about you for a long time. And, uh, of course, i got to show one of your book covers here. Boom. Oh, I sure. put, it in the wrong, put it in the wrong spot. i got to put it in the right spot. That's what she said. <laughs> yes, John, John this is going to be... A smile. <laughs> Wong Ho, guy. Don, Wong, Don, Ho. Wong Ho. <laughs> oh my That's God, where goes again? That's funny. Gung Ho, Gung Ho. 
Um, Death on Mars, the discovery of planetary nuclear massacre. Now you're going, wait, what? There were nukes on Mars? Well, if you read anything, anything by Bradbury, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, science fiction is often prophetic. Well, it's so funny, and, and that is true. Uh, I find a lot of um, science fiction inadvertently becomes prophetic. I mean, even Blade Runner, yes. you know, uh, Star Trek itself predicted so much. Uh, Anima was complaining Those, those to me. flippy phones, you know? Yeah, yeah. which I have one sitting there. That, that wasn't a, a prediction. That was an inspiration. Well, that's just it. It's 50% uh, prediction, 50% inspiration, because the guys who created the flip phone were inspired by Star Trek. But this is, uh, you know, a criticism I have for current Star Trek. It will never inspire any science people. It won't. It doesn't use proper science. It started to a strange new worlds, which I was talking to you about that, which uh, their theory that was used in the show is the modern theory of how event horizons work, uh, which is different than the way the previous theories were. And, uh, and I found that interesting that they were able to hide in the wake of the event horizon away from this alien creature. And I'm like, that's interesting. That's modern. Uh, and it's the first time I saw them use good science on, on current Star Trek. And uh, uh, yeah, you I watched mean, Star Trek? Did you like Star a Trek? Simple, a simple event horizon is just a simple surface, but that's a non-spinning uh, black hole. If it's spinning, which they are, they have to be because they stars collapse. And they well, in order to like consume, it has later. to. Yeah. So the, the actual event horizon kind of splits in two into uh, uh, something more complicated. In fact, instead of looking like a sphere, it's a tesseract. So it's you can actually get multi-levels uh, and perhaps even go dive. You know, this, is, this is the more complex spinning black hole solution to general relativity. And... Um, it's what leads one to believe that you can use wormholes for uh, travel um, between stars. It's one theory. And uh, mm. so it's really quite fascinating. I haven't uh, delved into it deeply. Uh, just a simple, the simple black hole formula, by the way, was invented by Laplace back in France in the 1700s. And he got the, he got the right answer, even though he, didn't know anything about general relativity. He just used Newtonian gravity. But uh, yes, uh, science fiction is often prophetic. And uh, uh, I was very much inspired by Star Trek to go into uh, space uh, science. Uh, and uh, I work on fusion, but also uh, rocket science. If a pla a pla I work with plasmas, which are very hot gas that conducts electricity like metal, like a lightning bolt or the Aurora Borealis. And if you can't work on fusion as a plasma physicist, uh, you know, tokamaks, uh, then you go into space where plasma is the natural state of matter, the stars, the nebula. And of course, uh, we use then plasma for propulsion, electric propulsion. And, um, I actually invented a rocket thruster that uses microwaves to make a plasma and then uses water vapor as a propellant. So it gets very good performance. Um, and has been so it's a space, space steam engine. It Well, the, what comes out is not exactly steam. It'll I got you, I got you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, but anyway, uh, yeah, my, my focus recently has been Mars science because we've uncovered yet more evidence that there was a nuclear holocaust on Mars. Now, this once again, a terrible thing. The only other option would have been a supernova. And we know that our sun still exists. Right. What, what happened on Mars can be described as an R process event. R process is a technical term for a process that occurs in supernovas and nuclear weapons. Um, and you can look it up on Wikipedia, they discuss it there. And it's responsible for making a lot of the heavy elements like uranium and thorium. But it also, when it happens, it 
the core of the star is full of uranium and thorium, and then it suddenly has this big burst of fusion neutrons as the star collapses on itself and then goes supernova. So the the intense bombardment by high energy neutrons of heavy elements is what what creates what it, that's called our process. And it has a signature. It produces a lot of one peculiar isotope of xenon, xenon being the gas they use in uh, photo flash units. Um, right. And it's a very rare, noble gas. It doesn't react with anything um, under normal circumstances. And it has an array, it has five different stable isotopes that are stable. I mean, they last forever. So once you make them, they're there as a sign that something happened. And the signature for a R process is an excess of xenon-129 versus the next most abundant uh, isotope, which is xenon-132. On Earth, the, the two are in balance, but and on Jupiter, they're even in balance, one to one. But on Mars, there's two and a half times more xenon-129 that there is 132. And I inadvertently showed this. I worked for nine and a half years at nuclear weapons, two nuclear weapons labs, Livermore, where I did my graduate work on fusion. And then I moved to um, Sandia Labs in Albuquerque and worked there for three years on directed energy weapons and fusion. And there I was looking at some Mars data and I showed it to a nuclear weapons expert who was down the work there also. And he said, oh, my God, somebody nuked them because he looked at the xenon uh, isotopes. And I didn't know what he meant at the time. Uh, as a fusion guy, we're generally worried about combining um, hydrogen into helium or helium three and deuterium and you know th things like that very low atomic number things but this is xenon which is produced by fission of you know so we were working on fusion so i knew it's nuclear physics down in the very low end of atomic numbers but not in the high end of xenon 129 but this guy just said oh somebody nuked him and then he looked embarrassed like he'd said something classified. We were standing in an unclassified area when he said it. And um, I have, I so I began a search to find out what was it he was referring to. And I finally found only recently that supernova, even though I can't find the classified, still classified results of flying aircraft through uh, mushroom clouds after hydrogen bomb tests where they saw this xenon-129 spike, supernova simulations show it clearly. So it is the signature of what's called an R process, meaning a terrible explosion, a thermonuclear explosion. Mars atmosphere is loaded with the residue of that. Not only that, but Apparently, when you do that, it bombards the surface of neutrons. So just imagine a, a big a, a big hydrogen bomb going off, bombards the surface of neutrons, the atmosphere, whatever atmosphere is there with neutrons, and creates all the xenon-132, uh, I'm xenon-129, and that hangs around forever. What it also does, and we just found this out very recently, is the neutrons from the bomb, they hit the, the rocks and they interact with the potassium there and produce a lot of what's called argon-40. There's 10 times as much argon-40 as there in, is versus like argon-36, which is just a kind of inert thing. So argon-40 is a stable isotope of argon. There's 10 times more in the atmosphere on Mars than there is on Earth. Not only that, the neutrons hit the uh, nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere or wherever this atomic explosion has occurred, and they convert the nitrogen, which is nitrogen-14, into nitrogen-15 with the emission of a gamma ray, which can really hurt you. But what happens then is so, so the nitrogen gets heavier. It turns more of it into nitrogen-15 
And we find that on Mars. There's 50% uh, more nitrogen 15 than 14 as there is on Earth, or actually about 100%. Well, so, I, I wanted to ask you a question, though, John, um, going back to argon itself, because uh, as I recall, maybe I, I, I misremember it. I thought argon sure. was made up of all three isotopes, th uh, uh, 36, no, oh, 38. Well, it's and, got, it's got there's argon, 36, you know, we're talking. So they're different. I thought they were all one. OK, no, no, there, there's there's three different isotopes of argon that are stable. They hang right. around forever. So. Uh, and argon-40 is the same way. And not only that, but the neutron bombardment of the rocks creates radioactive potassium, which hangs around for billions of years. Whereas, so, just to remind so, people, argon is not radioactive. No, it is not. Yeah. I These gases make sure are, the stable. Cat knew These that. are st stable nuclei. They hang around forever. Now, on Mars, they orbited spacecraft. So they, they not only landed landers to sample the atmosphere on Mars and discovered this xenon-129 anomaly and the argon-40 anomaly and the argon, the, the nitrogen-15 anomaly, all signs of, of a big nuclear event. But also they were orbiting the planet with a gamma ray detector, and they found there were two kind of relative hot spots on Mars in the north, uh, one at a place called Acidalia Planitia, in other words, called uh, Utopia Planum. And radiating out from there, <clears throat> this is in pota radioactive potassium, which is activated by neutrons from some big radiological event, and also thorium, which is would have been part of the event and then part of it just vaporized rather than splitting like uranium. Um, and this ended up on Mars, not only showing these two hot spots, both in thorium and uranium, which are radioactive and we make gamma rays, but then on the far side of the planet at what's called the antipode, where the shock waves from any big explosions would have wrapped around the planet and converged on the far side, you find a hot spot of both uranium and thorium. I'm not your uh, not uranium, but uh, uh, potassium. Um, the Russians found also a lot of uranium on the surface, and I asked the Americans why they didn't measure uranium, and he said, "Oh, it was too complicated," and walked away. So they have maps of uranium, which I believe show the same features. Two hot spots in the north, and then a smaller hot spot at the place where the shock waves all would have converged. So it looks very much like Mars suffered a nuclear holocaust, two nuclear explosions in the north. We're talking, if it was a hydrogen bomb, as big as the Empire State Building going off. The Russians, by the way, with their Tsar Bomba, showed that you can make a hydrogen bomb as big as you want. Yeah. And and they th theirs was 50 megaton. They could have easily turned it into 100 megatons. But apparently these things blew up in midair because they left no crater. There's no crater at the hot spots. It's smooth. So it blew up kilometers above the surface. And this is what you this is the same thing that happened at hiroshima and nagasaki there weren't big craters at hiroshima and nagasaki because they set off the bombs a thousand feet in the air because that would kill more people turns out because of the shockwaves we're talking very grim things here and um what death that's oh, nothing <laughs> well it's 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 both fascinating and tragic and nightmarish to contemplate that a, a planet like that looked like Earth with an ocean uh, like Earth could have been transformed into what it is now by a two enormous nuclear explosions. And apparently whatever objects caused this fell from space. And um, that's all I can really 
gain directly from the uh, the data, which is all published. There's a scientific article posted at researchgate.net uh, um, by me about our process events on Mars. I can send you guys the link. And um, we've submitted it to a major journal now to see, to just get it published. And it's just straight science. We don't speculate on what caused this. We just say it happened. Now, this, if this is true, and I have heard that this has been confirmed from buddies of mine in the uh, Intel community, what do we do if we find out that, oh, at the, the date of this event was probably 180 million years ago, uh, roughly the, um, the earliest age of the dinosaurs is called Triassic, and then the second age of dinosaurs, the Jurassic, is roughly the Jurassic, uh, Jurassic uh, transition about 180 million years ago. There were no people on Earth then. I just Whoever want to say that was a question that was asked by the memes of destruction. And I, I, I need to take it sure. just a moment here to say good morning yeah. to the rest of them that have jumped in. Jack of all casuals is here. And the memes of destruction are good friends to this channel. Uh, there are some interesting questions that popped up, John. Before, before and, we, absolutely. Give before me the we go into, into the question, let's, let's give, have a, a little breather here. And look who's breached the back door of all people. Yeah, I saw that. Penny did it. <laughs> Penny broke the back door. That's an ongoing joke that got started by another great channel uh, that we watch and are friends with called Latino Slant with Polly. Uh, Polly is a good friend of this channel and a good friend of mine. Uh, yeah. And he, um, he joked one time during a show, well, you know that Gary, he likes the back door. And... Six, who is also in the chat, by the way. Did I see her pop in? No, six, I haven't seen her. No. I thought no. I saw her pop in. But Six and Zax, who are two good friends of this channel, both started hashtagging that, Backdoor Gary. So Back now there's, Gary. This, well, Gary, there's this whole thing about how honor. gay I am. It's it's a joke about how gay I am. And uh, it's been this ongoing joke that just never gets old because I use this picture occasionally. Here you go. I am gay for this show. <laughs> I am gay for physics and rocket science. And so there's that joke. Um, so because they broke the barrier, here you go. You get a new video for breaking that penny. Here it is. Open your back door, baby. Loosen your hinges. I'll show you my key. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Any the time? back door? It goes there. well with rocket science, Gary. It yes, does go well with rocket science. Say, is there backdoor rocket science? <laughs> hey, rocket science. We all know what that was about from the very beginning. So, all I got to say is, um, uh, a lot of my friends, as a young adult, were scientists or engineers, which are still scientists, and. Sure. Um, God, man, uh, we would just sit there and we would talk that. And I remember my wife came home one day and she got so angry that all my nerd science friends were hanging out in the living room talking physics. And and she walks in, she goes, I'm so sick of your pseudo intellectual friends being here when I come home from work. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I will say that, uh, I don't know, uh, it, it, rocket science, well, physics. You know, astrophysics in particular, I find to be one of the most fascinating things to talk about. And I can't sure. remember his name right now. He's on uh, that show. He's the Southern physicist. Uh, he's from the uh, deep Taylor, south. Travis Taylor? Tra uh, yes, Taylor. Travis Taylor. Good, I love good that man, guy. Good man. Good man. I love science. that guy. I Red love Nick, how he Red went Nick, into... Uh, rocket scientist. Well, he went into doing that show for History Channel about... Um, uh, oh, I just forgot the name of that place, uh, Don. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker yes, Skin Ranch. Ranch. Absolutely Pardon skeptical. Me, just says, okay, I'll collect my check and go there and say some stuff. And he's been burned. Yes. <laughs> unexplainably bur burned by magnetic radiation. And, yeah, uh, I told him, I told him, don't go back there. 
<laughs> and yet he's going to go. Have Mexican Mexican Idol, Idol, man. Travis, you're a smart guy. Don't go back there. I don't know if he followed my advice. Oh, we anyway. we won't, Iron Man. Don't you worry. Th Mikey is but he's a good man. He's a good man, a, a superb scientist. Uh, by the way, Mexican Iron Man, you see the name there on the screen, uh, John? That is our producer. His real name is Mikey. Mikey Cano. Sure, Mike. And he wants to remind me for getting not getting sidetracked from nuclear discussion. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Mikey. Uh, great advice having a, you know. So we go back from the back show. door to the nuclear science and rocket science again. And apparently yes. back to the back door. Oh, my <laughs> God, you son of a bitch. Here comes another one. Oh, you bastards. Strong. I'm going to go check the back door. <laughs> <laughs> go check the back door. Um, yes, uh, Mexican Iron Man, you know it. Jack, all, Jack of all trades. Uh, our audience, our chat is there to try to derail us from doing all right. Show. That's their job. They they really work hard at it. Bill Barkley's not here for some weird reason uh, from Scotland. But uh, I want to point out some questions that came in. Came in. Came in. Um, let's see. That's Don't gooder, Gary. Very good. It, as my brother Mike would say, God bless, rest his soul, uh, it's more better. It's wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm the only one who who breaks English here, okay? What? <laughs> I can't understand him sometimes. Uh, don't grapes create plasma if placed close together in a microwave? They do. It is an established fact. It is scientifically documented. <clears throat> That's fantastic. Then of, a, uh, hey, we were, uh, I was hired at one point by the Air Force to make ball lightning. And I'd seen it done by accident in a ball in a microwave oven, so I just recreated the accident, and we finally ended up making balls of fire as big as soccer balls. Holy fact, shit! We got welder sun. We got welder sunburn from it. My chief technician, he he was Italian. He goes home from. We went up to New Hampshire to make this with these super microwave generators, and so he comes back home and. His wife looks at him and says, she says, where the hell have you been? And he says, oh, I've been. <laughs> yeah, because he's all suntan. <laughs> and he says, she says, why have you got a suntan then? Yeah. He, <laughs> so he looked in the mirror and he had this white stripe across his eyes. <laughs> all I get to say goggles. is it automatically with women goes to cheating. <laughs> yes. Well, he's Italian. He's Italiano, you know. God I got a I got a micro I got a microwave story here real quick. All right, a microwave story involving you, John. Oh, back what? about back about 90, 91. Right. Okay, before Vicky and I bought our home where we're at now, we were living in Sunlin. And uh John was out in uh in California. Well, I were you living here then, John? Uh, don't think so. No, I was, uh, I was, uh, uh, who knows where, where I where I think I was in Washington, DC in 91. Well, the big story of the day was crop glyphs. Okay? Yes. Crop glyphs coming out of the UK. Doug and Dave, you remember the whole Doug and Dave thing, right? Oh yeah. They were yeah. the guys that claimed that they were actually making all the crop circles, which was pure poppycock. But and anyway, then a, a, British, a British journalist tried to investigate their story, investigate, you know, who they were. Apparently, they were a pair of old mercs who used to work for MI6. And once he found out where they were, he went to the office where they were. And the office had been shut down and it disappeared. So they were they were put out by the British government to basically give the British public something reassuring oh yeah we yeah. did all we made all those crop circles ourselves well anyway john yeah. john yeah, was so out there wave. john was out there and uh he was over at our house and i was talking to him because i was doing a lot of investigation on what the heck this crop circle business might have been so john said look he said i'm going to show you something so we went out the front door to the yard cut a square of sod out of yep. the grass, put it on a paper plate, took it in to the kitchen, put it in the microwave, 
ran it for like 10 seconds, and all that grass did this, okay? It just kind of started yep. curling up, it all went laid down. down, went down and intertwined, which is what was actually happening in yep. the crop circles. So we came up with the conclusion that whatever was creating the crop circles had to be electromagnetic, had to be microwave. Somebody could sit up in a, in a some some like a helicopter or aerial craft of some sort or a balloon, and with a di microwave dish and actually paint those crop circles using concentrated microwaves. We right. showed that it was possible to do wow. that, and uh, and it would it wouldn't leave. You know, Doug and Dave, the two Mercs, the two old uh, rummies from MI6, they, they, you know, if you do use their method, it breaks the stalks. This doesn't break the stalks. The plants can keep growing. Interesting. Right. Oh, yeah. Which so is you exactly just what, what happened. It's what happened? exactly what happened. Yes. Yes. So if you guys so, were wondering in the audience, here's your answer. You learned something on our show today. Uh, you are now our rocket scientist in our pocket <laughs> to bring you on when questions come in, which I need to go back because there are some questions I'll take here. That, I'll take that as a good a lot thing. Of That's a good thing. I, I had a question, and, and then uh, Monkey Jeeves, Je Monkey thank you, come again, said um, the, exactly what was going to pop into my mind, which is, is there anything that could occur naturally other than um, a supernova, like, and he asks, an asteroid containing radioactive materials that could create the signature of an explosion. And what I was going to ask oh, is... Oh, that's a very good question. Is, I'll answer it. And I know this is really something that uh, I know I know the answer to this. I'm asking a question I know the answer to. Is the um, an atomic explosion something that can occur naturally? And then we'll end it there. Well, one of, the, one of the... One of the... Hypotheses that I investigated first was it a natural nuclear reactor on Mars? On Earth, in very rich uranium deposits, groundwater would get into the uh, uranium and it would form a moderated, it slows down the neutrons so the uh, reaction can have a chain reaction, just like in a natural nuclear, uh, just like in a nuclear power plant. And you can get a natural nuclear reactor. And apparently they found 20 different places in Africa where this actually occurred. What happens, though, is the, um, the groundwater gets into the uranium, slows down the neutrons. The uranium is very pure ore, very rich ore. And then it starts having chain reactions like a regular nuclear reactor. But then it gets hot and it drives the water out. And without the water, it can't can have a chain reaction, so it shuts down. It gotcha. needs moderation. And this, this, however, if one of those goes unstable, it blows up and makes a big crater. There are no craters on Mars. This has to have been happened up in the atmosphere, a couple of kilometers in the in. So it was an airburst. It's like Tung Tunguska. That big meteor that came in over Siberia in about 1910 blew up in midair and flattened uh, about 100 square miles of forest in Siberia. No one was living there, thank God. It just killed a bunch of reindeer and bears. And so this was a midair explosion. It couldn't have been a natural nuclear reactor. It has to be some other phenomenon. That is, un if it's natural phenomenon, it's it's an unknown phenomenon. Now, could an asteroid come into Mars atmosphere and do this? Well, it would certainly could release some, you know, thorium, which is radioactive, but it couldn't create a shower of neutrons when a meteor explodes. Like they they investigated thoroughly the explosion in Siberia to see if it it had any nuclear aspects. And it didn't. It was <clears throat> it was just an explosion that happens when something's moving really fast and runs into something. The the meteor basically vaporized and, and made a big 
vapor cloud and exploded. So yes, it could have brought something like that could have brought a bunch of isotopes to Mars, but it wouldn't have created the secondary nuclear reactions. One of the things they find in Mars rocks is a lot of what's called Krypton 80. It's, a, it's an isotope of, crypt, of uh, Krypton, another inert gas, and it's formed by neutrons bombarding bromine 39. We're talking kind of weird chemistry here. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a chemical like chlorine. And so anyway, it gets bombarded, it turns into Krypton 80, which then stays in the rock or goes up in the atmosphere. So there's a big spike at Krypton 80, which indicates, once again, big neutron bombard. They had to put rocks in new, natural, in, they had to put lava rocks from Earth into nuclear reactors and bombard them with neutrons to get the same effect that they found in these Mars meteorites. Right. This is where they well, got I, the rocks. I want to let you know, Means of Destruction said, we put argon in windows instead of krypton so Superman can still rescue you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, kryptonite. Yes, kryptonite. Uh, <laughs> Wong yeah, Ho, guy. Wong Ho. Wong Ho. Wong Ho. Gung Ho. <laughs> yeah. And this uh, is, he, he went on to ask maybe a uranium laden meteor. They blow up in the air sometimes, like the one in Russia, Tunguska Blast. Uh, well, there's, there's uranium in all rocks, a trace amount. Um, and but basically, uh, it would have to be a really big meteor to make all of the. Um, when they looked at the gamma rays from the, the Mars surface, it turns out it gives above average. Uh, on, on Earth, you have a certain amount of uranium, uh, thorium. Like I said, they, they claimed that measuring uranium on Mars was too complicated. This guy gave me that answer and then walked away. And I said, you mean you can't do what the Russians did in 19, uh, 1973? And he wouldn't answer. So the, 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 the government has, of course, cards it's not showing. It's just the way the government works. But what happens is if you imagine something creating uh, all of this uh, thorium and radioactive potassium, like from a meteor, covering the entire surface of Mars, uh, and then, then that would be a really big meteor. And there's no way that meteor would have stopped in the atmosphere and blown up. It would have hit and made a big crater. Mars is next to the asteroid belt, so it's it gets a lot of it get, it's rather accident prone. It's it's understandable. But it seems to have had the ability, just like the Earth did, to recover from big impacts like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Right. So any meteor big enough to make that much thorium and potassium cover the planetary surface. Uh, it's funny. That they measure the amount of, planet, of surface, uranium, uh, surface thorium and potassium. Um, with gamma rays, for, and then they're just measuring the top, very top layer, about the top of centimeter of Martian surface. They compare that to the Mars rocks that we have from Mars meteorites. There's roughly 10 times more potassium and thorium on the surface of Mars than there is in the rocks. The, the rocks are apparently from several uh, meters below the surface when they got ejected from Mars. Basically, big rock hits Mars, throws little rocks all the way out into space. They end up on Earth. That's how you get Mars meteorites. But these meteorites started out as rocks below the surface. And yet the surface of Mars shows far more thorium and potassium than are in these rocks that we get from Mars. So it's the asteroid idea, the asteroid hypothesis fails from the fact that there's no, it couldn't create the neutron burst that is observed. 
in the, the, the residues in the rocks. And also any meteor big enough to spread that big of a layer of potassium and thorium around on Mars surface would not have blown up in mid-air. What, what was the yield? It what was the yield? Up. What? What was the yield on that? The distance? Oh, it's... Circumference. It's it's 10 times the release of the Chicxulub meteor hit on Earth, which roughly, we're talking 100 billion megatons. These wow. These... Wow. This is just a yeah. mind-numbing energy release I like was, i said they, if they were hydrogen bombs they had to be as big as the empire state building i was going to ask if, if it could have been a experimental non-tripulated vessel it, uh, well atomic. this this absolutely throws out the martin uh, before yeah, you go there the yield? This, <laughs> the yield is too big for a meteor to have done it and not completely destroy the planet Right, it would have made any meteor explosion that big would have hit destroyed gone it. It through the atmosphere like a knife through butter. It would have made an enormous crater. Yeah, uh, and this, so and that this answers happened, that. By the way, we know this happened late in Mars history, not so we'd still see the crater. It still within one hundred and fifty million years. Um, yeah, about one hundred and eighty million years. One hundred eighty, roughly. So, um, I got to tell you. Um, what does this mean? Um, is this a sign of what we've been concerned with here? You know, we've been talking about it every UFO Wednesday. Is we know that they're here. We know yep. they're underground, We're most likely. Alone. Underwater, underground. Um, that uh, they see us as ants in an ant farm. They don't really perceive us as a threat. Though I yeah, do want to point ants out. nuclear weapons, though. Yeah, well, that's what. Uh, Jiba said here, the Italians say that UFOs can be hit with de depleted uranium shells and they have to leave stealth to attack or to defend. Oh, oh, there are numerous reports of, you know, jet fighters or even propeller planes gunning down UFOs. They're, they're not bulletproof. Yeah, and I mean, um, here, here, Don, let me give you an example. Okay. Let me give you an example. Roswell, the original big UFO incident, people don't realize what was stored at Roswell. All the nuclear weapons on Earth were stored at Roswell when the, the incident happened. At the Army Air and, Force Base, yeah. Yes, and there had been a lot of UFO activity all over the, uh, the um, uh, United States. In the, in the days running up to the Roswell thing. According to Philip Corso, who wrote a very good book called The Day After Roswell, the US government was very aware that somebody was snooping on our nuclear stockpile. So they moved all sorts of resources. He didn't say what resources down to New Mexico to guard it. And one of those things they, guard, they used to guard Roswell Army Air Base, where all the nuclear weapons were stored, is Black Widows, which were very common in the area of New Mexico. But these ones had 60-foot wingspans. They were night fighters from World War II. They were still the standard U.S. night fighter in 1947, two years after the war. They had veteran crews. They had a radar in their nose. And they had four 20 millimeter cannons on the bottom of the plane and four 50 caliber machine guns on top of the plane. And that's why two UFO crashes were recorded at Roswell in one night. One of them hit near Roswell. The other one apparently it ended, ended up in a up, trench, as I recall. The second what's one. that? The second, the second one, one ended trench. up, no, actually in Socorro, New Mexico, about 100 miles away. Apparently, it limped down and then crashed at Socorro. A lot of people witnessed that crash. Uh, everybody from the county irrigation uh, official going out and checking irrigation ditches saw this thing had crashed and it had a big gash in the side. It had obviously. That's, maybe that's where I get it because I remember the word ditches were used. Yeah, that's in, because in one that was a, one of the witnesses 
who um, spoke spoke about it later was an a irrigation official, and there were also some archaeologists in the area. There were even some campers. Apparently, that part, the plains of San Augustine, where that happened, was a right. fairly busy area that day, and it was a couple days after. It was like a day after, or the morning of Fourth of July. These people woke up at this one campsite and there's this crash flying saucer. And then the army, which was part of the Air, Air Force and Army were one unit in those days, arrived with deuce and a half trucks full of troops, told everybody, you didn't see anything. Yeah, and of they course. Took, they took the craft, they took the aliens. So there were two UFO crashes in one night. Yeah, and, I've, and so I tell people... All the time, and I'm curious your, your thoughts on this, because I know Don thinks the same way, uh, sure. that it was not accidental that no. the Air Force broke from the U.S. Army to become its own uh, branch yep. that year. Right after that happened. Right after it happened, and the CIA was formed. Yep. From the old OSS. And it you was all kind of, created hmm. to cover up, started. And Roswell. the National Security Act was put, in the, is, was put into yeah. place. So Which it's not a coincidence that under under extreme concerns of national security, the United States government had the ability up and to to preemptively kill if they saw someone as a national security threat. So oh, that that's very yeah. seldom discussed, but it's got to be. It's got to be brought it, into the public. It allowed so. way too much latitude to silence witnesses. And I attribute that rule being created to why so many died mysteriously. Um, I want to welcome our good friend, the 70s rock fan, to the show. And, of course, yes. LDG Free the Net is here. And if I didn't say so, Mexican Iron Man, Mikey Cano, welcome back to the show. It's a show you produce, so uh, whether you like it or not, welcome. Um, I love Mikey and hey, uh, Mike, the, you're doing a great job. Yep. He's a wonderful guy. And of course I want to welcome our good friend who has way too long a name. I mean, Courtney has nothing on you. Willie, the monkey King's musical channel of doom. That is a long name for your channel. Yeah. I'm just saying, man, um, U S Navy has the best air force. I don't doubt that for a second. And they don't well, call the story I pilots. the story I heard in Washington, DC is that the Navy, which has a global reach and looks not only above the ocean but under the ocean to watch yep. things, said this one Navy guy told me, he says, Hey, we, we got an air force, therefore the air the regular air force is superfluous. And we, we have the Marines, so the Army is superfluous, too. <laughs> um, um, I got to say, you know, that um, I wanted to point out that uh, Navy do not refer to themselves for a, a reason as pilots. They call themselves aviators. The reason why is go. they, they want to be completely distanced from <laughs> the Air Force that much. And well, in the, the military... Air Force to its great credit, whenever there's a war, they suffer typically higher casualties in the fighter, you know, in the, the air, their airmen suffer higher casualties than just about anybody. My pop was in the Army Air Force in uh, World War II, but they, they, uh, that they was the Army Air Force. That's that back when Army they were air cool. Force. That's back when they were cool. Brown, the Brown Shoe Air Force, they called them. Brown Shoe Air Force. Because they wore um, brown shoes like the army. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, and so, um, they they suffer in wars. The 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 uh, you know the pilots suffer a lot of casualties more than any other branch of the service tend tend to be even the marine even more than the marines because they're doing close air support and. Um, you know, so we can't just because the Air Force was apparently formed to keep this cover up in place. It was kind of part of its founding documents. Uh, this still doesn't uh, 
mean that well it doesn't dismiss the the quality work they do in the air no no and my son was air force uh which by the way he he really liked this uh let me let me uh take this down for a second just so i can uh show this i made this meme to poke fun at uh, the air force because as much as i love them i do poke fun at him here you go i think you'll appreciate this Because <laughs> they don't have to call in fire missions or, or uh, I, I work. Aerosmith. I work. I worked in an office where I had guys from every branch of the service, and everybody made jokes about the Air Force. They said they're the only people who've got air conditioners for their pup tents. <laughs> oh my God! I've got two stories. One, um, my unit. I was with the 308th Med Ambulance, and we were stationed uh, at McClellan Air Force Base. We had a, a strip mall. Sure. Yeah, half of it was our unit. The other half was the 921st MASH, or as we called them, the 920 worst. Um, they were just terrible. They're terrible doctors. And um, we, um, uh, my first meal was at the McClellan uh, Chow Hall, mm. which was like a mahogany, dark wood interior with fake candlelight everywhere, like fake lanterns. And I thought my sergeants were effing with me really bad. I'm like, uh, this is clearly well, not enlisted. This is you are messing with, you're gonna get me in trouble, is what you're doing to get, but no. And then these three guys came walking in to eat in civilian clothes, and my sergeants were like uh Sergeant Parker and Sergeant U Eugene Tevez pointed and said, No, those are those are Air Force. I'm like, but they, they got hair over their ears and mustaches out to here. He goes, yeah, it's different in the Air Force. And I'm like, oh, my God, I joined the wrong branch. And <laughs> um, so I uh, this is the thing in the military, and I, I hope you'll appreciate and enjoy this, which is when the Marines or Army describe the military, this is what we say. U.S. Marine Corps are devil dogs, uh, jarheads, uh, leathernecks. U.S. Army, doughboys, um, uh, dog face. Uh, Joe's, Joe's dog face, and both Marines and Army, grunts the u.s navy is of course swabbies and yes. that really gay one seaman um and uh, there's one more i forget but the fourth is of course the air force which all the branches refer to as civilians in uniform <laughs> well let's be fair hey, there's a lot of good people in the air force. i'm never fair i'm never fair john you'll learn that <laughs> okay 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 you're trying to be fine what do you think don You've been really quiet about I ain't, this. I ain't saying nothing. I'm thinking about <laughs> Veterans Day coming up here. Pretty yes. There you go. There you go. I was hoping that our show would launch this week before Veterans Day. And uh, and just, uh, Don, I, I, I think you'll find this funny. Every Veterans Day, I called in sick because I was pissed that we didn't get the day off as veterans. <laughs> 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 like, it's yeah. our day. What do you mean? <laughs> Well, the uh, veterans didn't get a day off on wet Veterans Day. Why should you? That's right. <laughs> but um, I pull out I my do... purple hearts and I polish them up on Veterans There that's you go. Right. Now, Darius Munchausen, once again, the safest Munch Munchausen for children. If Any we relation some... to uh, Baron Munchausen? I think that he is not related to him because even he was kind of scary for kids. Uh, if we build some thorium nuclear power plants out here, Driving a Tesla might actually be good for the environment. I agree. I agree. So there you go, the Darius. Thorium, the, you know, you know why we don't have thorium nuclear plants? Because it's too safe. Thorium makes very poor is a very poor material for nuclear weapons. Yeah, because so it can't be weaponized. It's, and it's uh, very difficult to weaponize it. So the, the uranium plutonium cycle one out because it supported national defense as well as generating power That's yeah exactly which is the complaint that a lot of us that are pro nuclear energy have yes. said for years like if you would just stop trying to use uranium and use thorium these guys would have no complaint protests well, will go away thorium is three today. times more abundant than uranium so it's amen it's it's got a lot of advantages to it, but it didn't support our national defense, defense. goals to have a thorium program. So 
it just didn't happen. You know, it was, it was all formed during the Cold War, the architecture of our nuclear uh, power industry. Right. was formed during the Cold War. Uh, wait, and, what? Hold on. Yeah. We I don't mean, have I'm, thorium plants because the hippies lied to us. Damn hippies. <laughs> Shut up, Jack. Blame it on the <laughs> we can blame many things on them, but uh, not this one in particular. It's, well, we uh, have reached this moment, and I will play yes. our little video. Here it comes. Are you guys ready? Hello. Yeah. Good evening, and welcome to the middle of the film. <laughs> it's the middle of the show. <laughs> the middle of the show. Hours with you because um, there's so much that we want to talk about in this second hour. Uh, I don't know about Don. By the way, can I send you a video to end the show on? You can look at it. I'll send it yeah. to you by email. Uh, you can send it by can, uh, private chat too. You can use that. It's a it's a YouTube video. It's a, I'll send you the link. And okay, it's my suggestion for end and for how, for how to end the show when you were were anyway, in the meantime, it's good. I'll send it to you. And um, so um, uh, anyway. Well, I wanted, to, I, wanted to I wanted to go into something else. I wanted to talk about something else. Sure. Um, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about the scar on Mars, because um, it has been said by many of the physicists whom I respect and admire that that is uh, uh, damage. This is not a natural occurring valley. That scar. It was done by either um, in a massive crash that landed sure. on Mars or that it was caused by a powerful electromagnetic weapon fired from space. Uh, my own, by the way, I do, I have been studying Mars for a long time, so I'm somewhat yes. familiar with the geology. If you, you're speaking of the Valus Marineris Canyon yes. system, which, you know, yes. basically would stretch all the way across the United States and is eight times deeper than the Grand Canyon on Earth. Yep. This is, you know, this, but there are features on Earth that are similar, but, you know, they're covered with vegetation, so you don't, they're not as dramatic. Like the Great Rift Valley in Africa is where a chunk of Africa is trying to separate from, um, the rest of Africa and float out into the Indian ocean. And it's created a big place where there's a chain of lakes and volcanoes like Mount Kilimanjaro. Oh, yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, off the horn of Africa, right? Right. It's near the horn yeah. of Africa. It's in fact, the horn of Africa is sort of where it starts. Now that's an example of, you know, a place where continental drift is, starting to work to split off a separate split off something from a continent on mars apparently the mars crust apparently tried to have um continental drift but it was frustrated because the um the crust on mars was too thick and also mars is a smaller planet so it had less geothermal heat so what happened if you if you look at a map, a good map of Mars, you follow the Valus Marineris Canyon system starts and it goes up as this big kind of crack, and then the crack ends with a bunch of spider work of fissures. And then beyond that, if you keep going, you find three big volcanoes and finally. Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano in the solar system. And it looks as though Mars had a bunch of, I mean, to me and to other scientists who study this, it looks to us like Mars was trying to do some continental drifting, splitting off a continent from uh, the southern part of Mars and making it go north. And but it got frustrated. It couldn't finish the job. And so what happened is you had this big crack open up and then the crack just terminated with a bunch of little fissures. And then the geothermal energy that was trying to drive that made three big volcanoes and then finally one giant volcano. And so if you follow the Valus Marineris, it points directly at 
Olympus Mons at the end. So um, there is a geophysical explanation, which is very dramatic, but not doesn't involve any directed energy weapons or anything like that. I mean, well, you, you know, here we, I am we saying there kinda... was a nuclear holocaust on Mars, but I'm saying I'm skeptical. I work on directed energy weapons. We we kind of skirted around the issue of why yeah. might someone have nuked Mars. Right. So, you know, was Mars just sitting there and somebody said, hey, let's have a weapons test? Or was there something there that these hypothetical aliens considered worth nuking? Well... First thing we would have to mention, and this also was not mentioned, is the face at Cydonia yes. and the pyramids the at pyramid Cydonia. within 25 kilometers of that face. Right. Apparently, there were sentient beings that were there, and... Uh, then you've got to ask yourself, well, how advanced or, or primitive were these beings? We're not sure. But then into the mix, in 1983, 84, our time, the Central Intelligence Agency employed some remote viewers during the Stargate program, which was still, as far as the rest of the country concerned, top secret, and these remote viewers were tasked to remotely view Mars approximately one million years ago. Okay? Now, this is all a matter of, of recorded history. The CIA admitted that they did this. They did not give us the conclusions that the remote viewers viewed, but we know that they did do that. So, John, that's an open door for you, my friend. Take off. Well, well, thank you. And thank you, John, for that excellent introduction to this subject. In the book I wrote, Death on Mars, I explore the full hypothesis. I would not have discovered evidence of this nuclear holocaust on Mars, which is now pretty overwhelming. Um, without first investigating the face on Mars and the pyramid stuff at Cydonia Menza, then I also found a second archaeological site, or what looks like an archaeological site, in Utopia Planum. It's called Gla It's now called Galaxis Chaos. There's a second face there that looks like the first face in Cydonia. It's about two-thirds the size of it, but we now have two really good pictures of it, and it's a face, just like the car. It's a, it looks like a car face like this one in Cydonia. All of this is documented, by the way, in the book, Death on Mars. And so uh, it looks, the civilization looks like it was targeted by this nuclear holocaust. Somebody didn't just come along to Mars and say, oh, here's, Let's drop some big hydrogen bombs on Mars. No, they were targeting somebody. For what reason? We don't know. The bombs apparently came down from space, blew up in midair. They were so large, no one would bother sending them up and then having them fall. It, it, they just blew up in midair. Uh, so it was not Martian. This was not a Martian event. This was some other intelligent species coming to Mars, or at least this is the detailed hypothesis, came to Mars, for some reason did not get along with the Martian culture on Mars that had built the face and the pyramid. And also there's a pyramid at Deuteronilus uh, Menza that casts a long shadow. That's, uh, uh, you can see that one. Deuteronilus Menza has a big, uh, pyramid there. And then, of course, there's Galaxis Chaos, another, uh, apparently another urban site. But what happened is it looks like the civilization was quite primitive. It looks Stone Age, like the early Egypt or the Mayans. 
there are no, doesn't look like there are roads or airports or anything like that. So you have to wonder why would somebody nuke a culture, target a culture on a planet like Earth that was not advanced? Maybe, they were maybe just sitting was. there. But, 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 I, but, but I must also add, I don't know what the technological level of that culture is. We have to go up there and dig and find out how advanced they were. And maybe they knew who came to get them. Well, may, maybe, maybe the story is up there buried beneath the, uh, the dust. What'd you say, they Martin? Were not a, uh, that maybe they were not a full-fledged culture. Maybe it was a little colony. Maybe it was a little colony. Uh, it reminds me, uh, oh, yeah, there's the, the rovers, by the way, were sent to areas as far from uh, Cydonia Menza and Galaxis Chaos as possible. But, okay, there's the original face. Now, 20, about 20 kilometers from that face is a five-sided pyramid. There are images where both of them can be captured at the same time. And uh, I put all those images, by the way, in uh, Death on Mars. And not only that, on the pyramid, there's this, what looks like a doorway. It's a square area. Basically, it's collapsed brickwork that fell apart in a, exposing a square on the um, uh, pyramid. Uh, apparently, these things were big landforms that like suggested a pyramid or suggested a face. And then and here's the five sided one that you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you look very closely, if you zoom in, I wish I could the bottom part of it, uh, you'll actually see a square area. Let me open it up a different way so we can, uh, I want to show it okay. to everybody. Um, and we second. have confirmed that with numerous new pictures that that square is there. And it's collapsed brickwork because there's a kind of a debris flow down below it. Here we go. I'm going to zoom in on this sucker. Okay, zoom in. Okay, uh, okay, raise it a little bit. Raise. Okay, now zoom in some more. Okay, up again. More? Okay, no, well, actually, you could just see, okay, see this square. Almost a perfect, well, it's a three Oh, right here. That's it. Holy and God, there's yes. a debris stream below it as if, and what it is. Yeah, you is can see it right here. Brickwork. It's a detail showing that this object was built, or at least it was surfaced with brick. And there are other places where you can see brickwork on these artifacts. Uh, so they are true archaeological relics. They are not just funny eroded landforms. And That's of course this one right is five-sided. And one of the uh, um, legs of the five side points towards the face as if they were all built to coordinate with each other and you could stand on one. And that's this one, as I recall, because it's off this one. Uh, right? No, actually, it's the, it's this the one? other one. It's, uh, no, this no, one. keep going. Keep going clockwise around. It's that one. Okay. That one points towards the face. Okay. And obviously, there was something more elaborate about it. But anyway, the, the really pristine face of the pyramid that is saved there has that little square area and we have got latest pictures showing that that is not an optical illusion it is there in numerous pictures with the new probes it's almost as if well let me tell you when i first found these things especially the nuclear data i reported it to the pentagon I didn't bother reporting it to NASA. I knew NASA very well by then. I reported to the Pentagon, to, specifically to the Defense Intelligence Agency, which I knew had a Mars desk. So I, they sent over somebody, and I gave them a full briefing on what I had found. And I asked them, what do I do? And they, the guy left. And he said, I'll discuss, I'll report this back to my superiors. 
I gave them a copy of the whole presentation. And after six weeks, they came back to me and said, publish. Mm. So the Defense Intelligence Agency wanted this to come out. Now, now look, um, uh, somebody mentioned this, and I, I get your reaction. <laughs> that was Monkey Jeebus said that in the chat, and I thought I'd share that. Um, Monkey Jeebus, all right. Well, here we go. I, a big question that leads back to something that uh, Don Ecker has talked uh, about and done research into is um, what connection is all this to what occurred in the recent history with Phobos 2 and the Russian satellites? Uh, actually, Don, Don would be able to speak that bat better than I would. Well, I, wanted to, I, um, I know Don's opinion. Hi, Don. I'm poking you, Don. I'm poking you. Um, <laughs> I wanted to get well, your take on it. Yeah, he's poking me back. <laughs> By the way, have you noticed no <laughs> f-bombs? No f-bombs this show. Yes, yeah, Gary, you're doing well. You're doing gooder. <laughs> I'm doing gooder. But any, I do want to get with that because uh, uh, Don and I have talked about this a lot, and I am curious of your thoughts on on Phobos too. Oh, are you still there, John? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. And okay. um, here, pardon me, pardon me. Uh, so, um, basically, oops, steam. Yeah, your pardon, video pardon froze. Me, steam steam, here I am. Here I am. Uh, the Phobos probe was done in the middle of the Cold War, and uh, when the Cold War was, you know, kind of having its last death spasms, and it was an apparent attempt by the Russians to demonstrate directed energy weapons. And um, Oh! Oh, we lost Whoa. John. I think His video think froze up. Lost. I was expecting it. Yeah, his well, video froze up. Well, meanwhile, could you when in the meantime in which John's get back Don, you have this question from Joe's atmosphere. Is Commander Ed Gaines, Ed Gaines yeah, yeah. As far as far as I as I know, I haven't heard anything from or about Dames for quite a while. Uh, now, just so you all know, he obviously, because of the Art Bell show, for many years passed himself off is one of the remote viewers during the Stargate program. He was not a remote viewer then. As a matter of fact, I knew quite a few of those guys who were actually RVers. Ed Dames was a monitor during that program. He himself never remotely viewed officially uh, uh, do those processes. Uh, uh, and who followed Dames during the course of the Coast to Coast Art Bell program, you'll see how many times Dames came on with some astounding and quite frankly terrifying predictions that he laid at the feet of Art Bell in his massive C2C audience. And they almost all imploded. One of the most famous, of course, was the hell Bop Comet, where Dames claimed he had remotely viewed the comet releasing a can or a container of some type with plant-killing pathogens that was going to impact on Earth, ergo wiping out the food sources worldwide, that there would be new plagues of AIDS-type viruses that uh, would be impacting the planet. The jet stream would come down from the sky, impact the planet with two and 300 mile an hour winds and other bullshit, okay? So I got to tell you, uh, I confronted Ed Dames at a couple of different meetings, wrote about it, 
in UFO magazine during that time period. And dames out and out lied to me, to my face, about <laughs> one of his predictions that involved a dying race of aliens that were allegedly going to land in New Mexico. And he gave the date, okay? He gave the date, and uh, they were going to ask Earth authorities for assistance because of their condition. Well, that was a pretty massive, big, you know, uh, I remember that by, happening, Don. <laughs> by dames. And of course, it never happened. It never happened. And later, I confronted him about that at a MUFON presentation he was giving. And he out and out denied he ever said it. OK, which which is pure bullshit. He did. So, you know, I got to tell you, when it comes to Ed Dames, I have somewhat less than zero respect for him. So I hope that answers your question. Worst Ed Dames <laughs> ever. That was for you, Don. Worst Thank Ed you. Dames ever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I got to tell you, man, um, that's some bullshit. The Because I do believe in the remote viewing. Uh, I don't believe in psychic powers, but I do believe in Jung's theories of how that stuff works. Well, then you should have met Ingo Swan, pal, because I'll tell you what, he had him in spades. Well, I my favorite hobby in the 80s was the call, um, the, the 1-900 numbers for uh, psychic line. And it, they would introduce themselves, and I'd, say, and I'd say, well, you're the psyche. You tell me why I called. <laughs> <laughs> it cost me a buck fifty, but it was worth it. Hey. <laughs> Each call. So, sorry, I disappeared there for a minute. I was trying to link to the video, which is just get your ass to Mars, has Arnold Schwarzenegger from Total yeah. Recall. Well, they mentioned yeah. pyramids in the film. Uh, yeah, they do. The, the first time I think it's mentioned is, well, they mentioned it early in the film and then later, uh, cause it's it, during his meeting with total recall as a company, yeah. they discuss, uh, you know, the periods of pyramids of Mars. And then later Absolutely. on the train on Mars, that guy that was in every eighties movie and show with the beard said something about the pyramids. Uh, and not, to, not to mention that the, uh, atmosphere generator generator was the pyramid. And you know, and I'm, again, I, I'm not saying it's aliens. <laughs> we have a new viewer. We do. Yeah, eyes wide eyes open. wide open. Eyes wide open. That I've is? seen eyes wide open before, so this is not their first show because I've seen that name. Uh, good morning. I uh, hope you're enjoying the show. Ford is back. Cod is here too. Uh, anybody else pop in? Joe's atmosphere, of course, the good friend of mine, military fellow military vet. Um, let's see. Gary is an incursion from the Sim uh, Simpson verse. I knew it. Yeah. I have been because of my ponytail. And when I was fatter, I kept being called the living uh, epitome of the comic book guy from Simpsons. And I said, I'm nothing like him. And I didn't know how to do his voice. And then one of my gay friends goes, all you got to do is this. And he told me how to do it. And I went, I tried it. went, oh, my God, I can do the comic book guy from. Oh, no, this isn't a good thing. This is not a good thing that I can do him. <laughs> Because it's going to make it even worse, the, the comparison of my ponytail and being a nerd. So, um, welcome to the show, and uh, good to see you, Ford. Ford is always back, even though, for me, I'm a Chevy guy. Um, Ford means found on road dead, because every Ford I ever had died. <laughs> or fix or repair daily. <laughs> fix or repair daily. Um, but, yes, welcome to the show, guys. I hope you're enjoying it. Um, I did, uh, you know, because look, you know that in nature, there's no such thing as a right angle. Right angles do not occur. But no. we have found that there are angles that do occur in nature with the rocks off Ireland sure. that have the octa octagonal shape, right? It's octagonal. Oh, it's, hexa right? it's he okay. hex hexagonal. It's um, like a honeycomb, like a honeycomb, yeah. you know, which the bees make. So Yeah, and it's interesting how that occurred in nature. Because it's sort of like the way crystals are made, period. 
But right. I mean, so we know though, do have right angles on them. By so the we way. know that those angles do exist in nature. What we know doesn't exist is right angles. That is where it goes straight up and immediately makes a sharp turn to the right or left. Yes. And that does not occur in nature. And whenever no. we see something like that, it's weird. And that's why when you see, mm. well, not you can't argue. The big argument for the five-sided pyramid is the fact that right angle door is on there. It's right. a square. That it's doesn't square. Well, we kind of got sidetracked with John's technical glitch. He was yeah, starting sorry. to talk about directed energy weapons, and you uh, were yeah, asked, just... John, about Phobos, Phobos II. Two. And yeah, the Russians. Now, now, I had actually, believe it or not, called the Office of the Secretary of Defense to protest that the Russians were going to do a directed energy test on the Phobos mission. And they said, well, that's nonsense. <laughs> and Cap Weinberger was the Secretary of Defense. So I, I just thought, okay, well, I did my best. And, and I was working at Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque in the Defense Lab. And so then a couple of weeks later, though, Cap Weinberger suddenly got all upset about this Phobos mission, that it was a directed energy weapons test. And <laughs> so apparently once one of the Phobos craft got near Phobos to do this directed energy weapons test on under the auspices of finding out what, to, you know, it's like, uh, you know, setting off a nuke on, on a planet to find out what it's made out of, uh, you know, so anyway, so this thing comes up to Phobos to do this directed energy uh, sample of the Mar of the Phobos surface, and then guess what? Don, you know what happened better than I do. All I heard was yeah, strange well, reports. Right. It it was actually boiling it down fairly simple. NASA was an integral part of that Russian mission, okay? NASA also had several scientific experiments on board the Phobos II craft. And what nobody has mentioned yet, although I've talked about it many times in the past, the original idea that they were working under at that point was a joint American-Russian mission to Mars, manned mission right using russian cosmonauts and american astronauts and the right. the laser that the russians had on board phobos 2 very powerful laser was to fire a series of bolts or laser blasts into phobos and analyze the resultant gases that would have been expelled because of a result of the test, the laser test, they wanted to analyze what Phobos was made out of. Now, <clears throat> Phobos itself has a very interesting history. Both Phobos and the other moon, Deimos, are in retrograde orbits around Mars, not a natural event. <clears throat> it's almost as if someone put them into orbit. And even though we had the technology for centuries to observe the moons of Mars, they were never discovered until about the mid-1870s, the first yes. time they were ever observed. Now, in the 50s, Soviet astronomers even published and theorized that Phobos may in fact be an artificial satellite, okay? So nobody really knew what Phobos was. And the idea when Phobos 1 and 2 took off was that Phobos would be the landing pad for this hypothesized joint mission to Mars where excuse me, Russians and Americans would land on Phobos first, then yes. go down to the planet. Okay. A very sensible well, idea. Phobos had already completely photographed the surface 
aspect of Mars at that time and surprisingly found a number of hot spots on Mars. In other words, areas with heat that should not have been there. Now, Zachariah Sitchin, in his book, Genesis Revisited, hypothesized that that might have been ancient alien bases from the past that were reactivated. Now, Phobos II also photographed all around Mars, including a giant ellipsoid shadow reflected off the surface or off the atmosphere of Mars, which Sitchin included in his book, Genesis Revisited. Then it turned around and started photographing behind it to find out what that thing was and discovered an object that the Russians at Glav Cosmos estimated to be 25 kilometers in length and one and a half kilometers in diameter, which comes out to an object that was a mile in diameter and 15 and a half miles long that then turned toward their probe and rammed it, destroying it. Now, even the Russians admitted that something rammed their craft. I was the guy that was able to get the first photograph from Glav Cosmos from the Russians, from Dr. Marina Popovich, which I later showed on CNN, uh, on Larry King Live. And then the acrimony began that it was not a real thing. It was simply a computer glitch on this photograph, blah, 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 blah. But the object had been photographed in the infrared, okay? So yeah. whatever was there, all right, whatever was there, even if it was a computer glitch, rammed the Russian probe, destroying it. Interesting. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to show an image. Sure. Uh, here we go. Uh, there it is. The hell's that? Uh, that is the object that has been declared to have had solar panels and such that struck uh, the Russian. Oh. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this was even mentioned, this incident was even mentioned in Aviation Week or aviation leak, as we used to call it, <laughs> um, at the time. And what's interesting, though, is they never showed any pictures. They just said, oh, there was a cylindrical object seen approaching the Phobos probe. And they speculated it was a fuel tank from earlier in the mission that had somehow tagged along like a lost dog uh, following the Phobos probe all, all the way to Mars. <laughs> So it made no sense. But then they, they said, okay, this cylindrical object was photographed approaching the, uh, the Phobos Mars probe. And then they said they didn't show any pictures. They just mentioned like in about two sentence summary of that. It was, uh, it was very strange. But, you know, at that point, I knew there was, let's say the government had cards it wasn't showing at Mars. Uh, you can consider the Mars cover-up to be a subchapter of the UFO cover-up at this point. Uh, the, basically, the U.S. government is finding evidence that we're not alone in the universe and is figuring out how to break this to the public. And Mars may be the best way because it's a dead civilization that was may, became extinct 180 million years ago, so it's not a threat. And whoever did it is pro is long gone, um, and probably uh, the law of karma has caught up with them by now. So um, this may be a way that the um, U.S. government is trying going to try and break the fact that we're not alone in the universe to the American public by showing them a dead humanoid civilization 
that perished 180 million years ago. Um, and um, that is much less threatening than uh, people flying around, abducting people, uh, mutilating uh, cattle, and uh, causing crop circles with jet fighters uh, chasing them. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I was. And yeah. let's, let's not forget, and I, I've mentioned it several times now, that CIA remote viewing session on Mars. Of all yes. places, why Mars and why a million years ago? Now, a little bit has come out. I don't know how much is uh, is accurate, but there have been rumors about that RV session, which claimed, okay, that the remote viewers basically were able to see, by our standards, very large humanoids, okay, in an area that seemed to be suffering an ecological disaster. And sure. this, this is basically the extent of, of what did come out. They were looking for ways to get out of there because their civilization was dying. Now, John... If you're correct about a 180 million year year ago event, this took place roughly a million years ago, then the question is there may have been survivors or something survivors I don't know. Underground who managed to uh, perhaps they they knew this was coming. Some of them had uh, prepared underground shelters and they would have been able to survive. And um, but it would not it would have the, the whole planetary um, environment was taken from being Earth like to moon like on Mars as it is now. So it would have been very, very hard to continue. So it would uh, seem to suggest that if we get there, we got to look for these underground facilities. Yes, we do. What is in, what is imperative, in my opinion? is we have to go to Mars now. It's no longer optional, it is mandatory. And by the way, you have to have boots on the ground and trained eyes and people who can dig with shovels and work with pickaxes to find out what is six feet under the layers of dust on Mars. You could drive a rover around at Cydonia Menza for years and not see anything unless it was by accident. Uh, you know, some some fortuitous outcropping with hydroglyphs on it or something. You have to send people there. We have to basically send people up to Mars to find out what happened. It could have been a natural event. Well, the big question is, could yeah. this have, could this happen on Earth now? Well, it doesn't really matter what happened on Mars in terms of who caused who or what caused it yes it can happen on Earth in either case if it was natural it was some natural strange solar flare phenomenon uh, then that could happen to us uh, and if it was other aliens targeting a civilization on Mars then we know, that the nature of the universe is that it, it is that it is rather predatory or has predatory elements. Right. So we have to be ready for that too. The only way to prepare for that is to become spacefaring. The best way to become spacefaring is to go to Mars, face up to the facts there, man up. You know, it's a, and this is a, tragic nightmarish scenario we're looking at i would urge that uh, the people they send up there people would be people like you don special forces with uh, combat experience land them they'll, on the they'll need medics too just so you know i'm yeah, a medic oh, absolutely no no absolutely uh in fact one of the, my my i just want to feel important john that's all no <laughs> 
scary. <laughs> you are important. You're very important. So, so, so yes, you have to have met. One of them's got to be a medic, just in case, you know. So basically, if you land on Phobos, someone first, gets their ass shot off, right, Don? <laughs> hey. <laughs> not funny, Gary. Not funny. He's a little he funny. Still does have an ass. I can testify to this. You know, but it's a yes. Hundred thirty. Oh, by the way, John, this just in: we have footage from Mars. Uh, here it is. Oh, it's just a dream. <laughs> well, go to the go to the plan. The plan is to get your ass to Mars. Get Short segment, ass. like only get about you a ass minute. To Mars. <laughs> the plan: get your ass to Mars. No, we have to. We have to get our asses up to Mars. I agree. Uh, we should have been to look, find we out have never what left happened the moon. as much as we can about what happened, why it happened, and can it happen on our planet. We absolutely well, should for have what ne it's never worth, left the moon. I, I think we were told we, have we were told to get the hell off the moon. You see, I believe you're right. Well, obviously, that's going to have to be that question is going to have to be debated all over again, isn't it? Because if somebody tells us we can't be on our own moon, then we have a problem with that. You might ask. Why anybody would say that if they're on the far side of the moon where no one can see them? Why don't they just build their stuff on the front side of the moon or everybody can watch? Why are they so bashful if they're so powerful? Hmm? And I examined that in a series of science fiction novels, beginning with the collapse of the UFO cover-up. And, well, here, uh, here's a very, speaking of the moon, I, I find this very strange. John was the assistant to uh, the Clementine director I, when Clementine I was, I was went not back. A I, I was more like, he was Marshall Dillon and I was Festus. He would sick me on problems. And he, he, I actually, he actually gave me a great compliment. He said I was his tiger team. I would solve oh. problems for him, but well, I here, not, here's the whole thing. No here's the whole thing about Apollo on that mission. What's that? What's that? Go ahead, Don. Here's the whole thing. We went to the moon and landed six times. Okay. Yes. We got up there. We landed six times. When the astronauts went up there, and this this was something I've mentioned here before, and boy, I'll tell you what. I, I caught a lot of flack over the years when I pointed out that the astronauts originally were all armed when they went to the moon, okay? Yes. The last time we were on the moon, we left in December 1972. That was the sixth mission. Now, there have been rumors that there were secret missions that went back to the moon. Uh, I don't think that's true. But be that as it may, we stopped. Well, you watch the Saturn okay? V. After, 72, no. after yeah. 72, it was all done. But then yeah. in 96, we go back, not under the auspices of NASA, but the Department of Defense completely remapped the entire moon. Okay. Yes, we did. Photographed we found it water. with the We found water, too. The, with the most powerful satellite technology we had at the time. Now, having been involved in military intelligence in Vietnam, what's the only reason you go back and you rephotograph a site? You want to see what possible changes there were. Okay? No Are comment. there new facilities? Are there new weapons no in placement? <laughs> Are there et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And how many of those photographs from the Clementine mission have ever been released? Brandenburg was not even allowed during that mission to go over and talk to the people that 
were receiving the photographs. That was all top secret, well, uh, what they were getting back. Yes, it was a very interesting mission. We uh, we demonstrated a lot of great technology on that mission, and that's about all I better say. <laughs> well, I do want to say uh, I was actually to told I was actually told by somebody. Don't talk about the. Uh oh. You can talk about yeah. Mars, and I kept what? thinking why, and I thought well I Mars is farther producer. away. What's that? I was the research producer. I was the research producer on a television show that aired on July 20th, 2014, which was, I believe, the 50th, would that have been the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 touchdown? And uh, the bottom line was, I, I got John to come on that show. He talked about the moon, and after the show was over and aired, he received several telephone calls that had his ass chewed off. <laughs> I'm still sitting on cushions because of that. So my response to your statement is a firm no comment. At this point. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to welcome uh, Cavatino Calvaryman Che, a fellow uh, uh, All right. veteran from the military, and Keto Simple, my good friend Dustin. Uh, is here, and of course, a young lady we all love. The Peter Vinkman fan side is here. Uh, welcome, Peter to the Vinkman. Show, guys. And uh, all these, let's see, why a floating space station instead of a bubble on the moon? Well, the are away, and uh, the, the space station is really heavy. Yeah, a date. So, I dated a girl uh, who took me to visit her uncle. We went on about lasers on the moon that can be used to fire on earth uh i don't know about that Dustin, but that sounds scary well um, and anthony kiedis says china's on the moon on the dark side uh, i uh they got a little rover roving around up there you know one of the problems with the moon the is, jade uh, rabbit i believe the Jade they Rabbit. The yeah, Jade, Jade Rabbit. Rabbit. I always thought the Jade Rabbit was one of those uh, dirty uh, sex talk things. No, like a, that's like JD. a donkey punch <laughs> or the Bismarck. I'm just saying. Um, according to uh, 70s Rock Fan, 1972 was the year that Gary graduated high school. He was 27. Uh, to that, uh, Brian, I say, eat shit, you mother. <laughs> and where was my invite to your show? Huh? Where was my invite? Hey, the important thing, Gary, is that you did graduate from high school. Well, I, I you may have been school. twenty-seven, but and you I got, got a diploma, GED. right? Well, I I quit high school. I threatened to punch my principal, walked out, and then took my GED because I refused to go back to the school. But well, that's, I did that's a very graduate. <laughs> that's that's good. Congratulations. I was 48 when I... No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> wait, Jeeba says, I'm pretty sure the Jade Rabbit is a micro vibrator sold, to Ch sold by China. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, yeah, the, uh, the two heroines in my novels. Whoop. Oh, boy. There they are, blonde and Asian. Jade and Blondie, they call them. <laughs> Nothing to do with the Chinese uh, little robot that's rolling around <laughs> on the moon. Um, oh, but, yeah, um, or other contexts. Anyway, uh, <laughs> well, you know, how, you know, two beautiful women do bring down the UFO cover up because they're news anchors, they want to be taken seriously. But anyway, that's that's science fiction. Yeah, and uh, to Darius Munchausen, here's your video. Uh, phrasing. Uh, phrasing. I'm cut. And. Shut up! There's a lot of Arnold on this show. Um, 
But Do, play the clip on, clip on Get Your Ass to Mars. Yeah, there. that's what you should be. Hashtag Get Your Ass to Mars. That's what we should be hashtagging, not Backdoor Gary. And for the Backdoor Gary here. Like, wouldn't you know that backdoor would trigger a trap door? Yeah, baby, you know it. Um, like uh, Mr. T, uh, Eddie Murphy said, Mr. T said, yeah, stick, stick it in. I'll squeeze my butt cheeks together and rip dick off. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you know Eddie Murphy, that's a messed up joke. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that particular quote. Oh, it was from uh, Delirious. Yeah, I think it was Delirious, his uh, comedy show. on. They put it on Showtime, I think. Uh, I'm not familiar film. with that one. I missed. I somehow missed out on that one. And li lastly, for Keith, who I hope is watching today, um, everything went black. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing, amazing. We're down to the last fifteen minutes, and uh, what okay. subject would you like to talk about? As bottom we line. Out? And you were going to okay. send me a video. Did you send it? No, I could. I when I when I disappeared that's temporarily. Did. That's what I was trying to say. Just just go on YouTube and say, "Get your ass to Mars." Uh, and there's a really short one with only. And it's great. The bottom line: apparently, Mars suffered a nuclear holocaust from unknown. For, from an unknown cause, for unknown reasons. It, they may have been targeting somebody. It happened 180 million years ago. We have to go up there now and find out how and why this happened. And we had need boots on the ground. None of this sending a bunch of robots to do this. You have to send people who can dig and have trained eyes. And get, yeah, exactly. And give reports of what they're seeing. Um, Absolutely. Now we land on Phobos first, and then we send a team to the surface from Phobos because Phobos acts like a nice base camp. You know, the whole thing will be under the auspices and wrap of national security, John. Even if they do that and they get up there, they're not going to release that information. They won't. I think they will. I think they will. I think they'll have to. When they told well, I think me, hands here we are. Forced. Here, here we are, almost eighty years publicly into the UFO question, the conundrum, yes. and yes. we still. I mean, the evidence in a court of law would be so overwhelming that some oh, yeah. type of technology is flying through our skies with virtual impunity. And they still refuse to acknowledge it. Yeah, so if they like, go to Mars, uh, find a dead civilization. They're not yeah, going to U.S. Go. Space Force, U.S. Space Force denied it, which they are the Air Force. So yes. they're such assholes. They really are. Well, well, look at who's releasing all the videos, and has the experts Navy. talking. It's the Navy. Yep, and the DoD through the Pentagon finally said, "Yeah, it's true." Um, and but the Air Force is still plausible. Air Force has been very, very quiet about this whole matter. Now, let's just well, let me put it this way when in my 20s, my parents became fundamental, their oldest child and a loyal son. I joined them at this fundamentalist church. I heard from the pulpit that there was no extraterrestrial life. Whoop. I heard from the pulpit that there was no extraterrestrial life several times. And a lot of, there are a lot of very religious people in this country who find this all, they shouldn't be alarmed. It's in the word for world that's translated for world in English in the New Testament is the Greek word cosmos. Yeah, for God so loved the cosmos that the sun. Yeah, uh, well, I got to say also that um, uh, there's been discussion previously on the show uh, that there are those in the Pentagon who believe that aliens are demonic. That this is well, a, a spiritual thing. some of them obviously. 
are are pretty bad. We're dealing with the scum of the galaxy in some cases, I think. <laughs> Just like in Star Wars. Absolutely. A hive of scum and vill villainy. A hive of scum and villainy. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there are nice people out there, though. Uh, probably we're related to them. We're probably the result of shore leave. Who knows? It's but the important it's like thing the for Spanish us right now. Spanish with the now Irish all over again. Is hey, and I'm, <laughs> I'm about half Irish myself. So I'm black Irish. So clearly, the Spanish got into my blood. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Spanish Armada it was a partial success. They managed yeah. to <laughs> land in Ireland. There. Yeah. They didn't land in England. They did land in Ireland, though, after the big storm. The right seamen there. left their seamen behind. <laughs> well, that's, that's suddenly a bunch of uh, dark-haired uh, people appeared in Ireland after that, yes. But important thing is we have to go up to Mars now to find out what, how, and why this happened to the best of our ability to make sure it doesn't happen to us. Exactly. And by the way, so we Palmer, have to get our ass to Mars. That's right. Uh, here's a moment from Palm, uh, Palmer in The Thing that I think fits here. Do you believe any of this voodoo bullshit, Blair? Child, child, chariots of the gods, man. They practically own South America. I mean, they taught the Incas everything they know. Hey, Martin, you're from Venezuela. Do the aliens own Venezuela? No. The commies and the narcos do. The commies and the narcos do. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, in, in the immortal words of Arnold to Arnold, it was Arnold talking to Arnold. Now, this is the plan. Get your ass to Moss. Absolutely. <laughs> do it. And that's, that's where we need to be. As quickly as But we as do need possible. to face the reality of what's going on with in you know aliens and um that as long as uh, we're not a threat they're benign it's well, when we become a threat that they we're, we're going to go about. investigate and you uh where a nuclear holocaust may have occurred if anybody wants to stop us let them show themselves we're going amen. up there amen and um, I guess now I will do my final thank yous. Um, let's see. I want to start at the beginning uh, with uh, Real Wave Nation, uh, Penny, Anima Confusa, Scott Lewis, Sean E. Step, D. Bud Martin, Dragon Ruse, Colonizer Jeebus, the Jeebus previously known as Monkey Jeebus. I say Settlement uh, Jeebus. Settlement Jeebus. Settlement, settlement Jesus. Um, the Jack of All Casuals, Memes of Destruction, Mexican Iron Man. All right. Mexican Iron Man. Of course, he, he is uh, one of the biggest supporters of this channel. Uh, Willie the Monkey's, uh, the Monkey King's musical channel. Of, Jesus, dude, shorten that name. God, you're killing me. That 70s rock fan, whom we also know as Brian from Scotland by way of Canada. Brian from Scotland. I'm a little bit Scott. He's a, he's a little bit too, or I should say he's a Scott with a little bit. And LDG Free the Net. I find that hard right to believe. Him. Ford is, he suffers the Irish curse. Anyway, Ford is back, COD. Cavity, Cavatino Calvary Roman Che. Now you're talking trash about the Irish and the Scots at the same time. Yeah, I tell people I'm mostly Irish. Jerry, Jerry, <laughs> I'd be careful. I'd be careful. <laughs> <laughs> the Peter Vinkman fan site, uh, Mighty Rax. Thanks for coming to the show, and we have thanked everybody in the chat. I hope everybody enjoyed this show today. It was a lot of fun having you on, John, and I'd like okay, to have you on great, again. And always Very great to be here with you, John. You know so much about the, you know where the bodies are buried in, <laughs> in the whole situation. And it's all that's about right. For the right, for the right, for the right. Check them out. I can uh, disclose that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, get our ass to Mars. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, we are going to wrap the show up now. Uh, what I ask is, uh, would you stick around for Jerry, thank another, you so much for having me on. Would you stick around for another 15, 20 minutes? Because uh, one of the things I offer our members 
is a chance to uh, uh, they love hanging out with Don, but to get a chance to bug you and and sure. talk some weird shit because I'm going to tell you right oh, now, sure, Colin, sure, sure. Colonizer Jeebus is always high. That's all I'm saying in his defense. He's always high. <laughs> well, you have to go high to, to reach Mars, so that's yeah, he walks exactly. around with his favorite bong. He's, He's got always got it bong, in his hand. Right? He does. It's always in his hands. But Monkey is a, a great member of the show channel and, and uh, chat, and he is uh, one of the big supporting members of our team. And I want to make sure to send out an invite to everybody right now uh, that are members to join in the post show uh, and maybe have a few words with uh, our guest today. Um Please don't I'm going to step away from the camera for just a few minutes when you close. <laughs> All right, we're right going to we're going to close now with uh, a little. Well, once more, I'm going to play this one. I'm going to play this video here. Now, this is the plan: get your ass to Mars. Amen. There you go. And uh, for the end of the show, we can do we, it. We play our outro credits. I want to thank you for uh, being here and stick around for after the show, John. Hey guys, thanks for watching Pop Culture Minefield. If you've enjoyed the show, please make sure to like, subscribe, and don't forget to click the bell icon for updates on our shows and channel. Also, please leave a comment, and we'd like to know what you thought of the episode, as well as letting us know if there's something you'd like us to cover in a future episode. Don't forget that you can become a member of Pop Culture Minefield now. Make sure to visit our membership page and merch store at popcultureminefield.com. You can always find Pop Culture Minefield on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. Remember to spay and neuter your pets.